Um, first of all, I'd, I'd wish to thank Alan for asking me to do this talk. It's a great privilege to be on the session this evening. And also many thanks to all of you who have logged in to hear me. The talk is roughly in four sections illustrated by slides throughout. And I'm going to dive into technology and go into screen share. And hopefully this will work. Right, is everyone seeing a slide? Yeah. Good, yeah. excellent. Right. So the talk is in roughly four sections. Um, for, firstly, what I do, how I learned to do it, and where I'm coming from. And secondly, the main stages in my career. And thirdly, a brief look at how it's done. And lastly, further slides of some of my work. At the end of the talk, questions will be most welcome, and I shall try to answer these as best as I can. Um, the, I'm, I'm ba as, as Alan said, I'm basically what, what's known as an architectural illustrator, and I produce images of buildings or any other developments prior to construction. These are referred to as perspective drawings, artist impressions, and very often that ghastly expression, visuals. Um, the purpose of these is for planning applications, public submission, competition entries, display boards, um, and the clientele includes architects and engineers, developers, estate agents, corporate groups, and private individuals. I do, as Alan mentioned, I do both drawings and finalized digital images, uh, but it's the drawing work that's the subject of my first publication and also of this talk. Um, the, the, first, the first influence, I was trained as an, an architect at Edinburgh University in what was then the newly formed School of Architecture, which was founded and presided over by Sir Robert Matthew, Sir Robert Matthew who was a, a major figure in post-war British modernist architecture and a founding partner in the global multi-practice rum jumps, that's Robert Matthew Johnson Marshall and Partners. During the university course and afterwards, I found the time to produce the occasional architectural model and also perspective drawings for other students who were doing their own final degree presentations. Payment, sometimes, <laughs> was either a couple of tenors or the odd bottle of malt whiskey. Um, you got to start somewhere and that was the introduction to illustration work. I already knew enough perspective technique and had the motivation to put it into practice. Apparently, as I heard of the grapevine afterwards, there were a few raised eyebrows when yet another slightly familiar looking perspective appeared on the wall at somebody's final degree presentation. What they saw was probably something similar to this later sketch. Um, then the, the second influence was, um, I, I was quite lucky here. I, I was um, introduced by a colleague to the well-established architectural illustrator, Sandy Bell. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not to be confused with the other Sandy Bell, who's a publican extraordinaire, I'm sure most of you will have come across him, in Forest Road. Um, he, uh, but bo both had their different talents, much appreciated. Edinburgh has boasted two well-known gentlemen by that name. So Sandy, the, 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 one, uh, the one I was working for, tried me out for a pound an hour, which wasn't too bad in these days, considering I was at the very beginning and just an ex-student and sent me away for a week to set up a draft perspective. Incidentally, what he asked me to set up was a perspective of a multi-storey car park. Now, although these are ramped and most are at least roughly rectangular in plan, um, this one was no rectangle, it was an ellipse. So <laughs> despite that, I was back in two days, much to Sandy's surprise, I may add, and with the next job, my hourly rate had doubled. The next job in question was an external steel fire escape. Now that sounds easy enough, but this one was a spiral stair. So he, I think he must have seen me coming. Anyway, this was the, uh, the beginning of the most enjoyable five years, setting up and drafting perspective drawings, collaborating over rendering work, a bit of watercolor, gouache, pencil, etc., and effect, in effect, a great apprenticeship, which certainly set me up. On the slide here, this, this, this drawing here, that spanned about two drawing boards and there were four of us working on it. And it was, it was uh, we all had a, 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 pen, a, a drawing pen in one hand and, and um, it, was a, 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 it was a development of, for Suez City, which is right at the top end of the Red Sea. Um, 
th this one here was just a, an ordinary bog standard shopping centre sort of um, uh, bread and butter stuff. And then this was uh, the St Nicholas shopping centre in Aberdeen, um, a la early 70s. Um, so, so then, uh, I th then came uh, a, another move in my career, um, about three to four years later, I was with Sandy for three to four years, and a lot of the business at that time was for the Gulf states in the Middle East, and one of Sandy's clients who had commissioned perspectives for a project in Doha was also looking for people to help out with drawings for a competition entry for Abu Dhabi. The client in question was Crichton Lang. He was a partner at EMG Lindsay's and Partners, Edinburgh, uh, well-known architects um, in these days. When he saw one of my drawings in Sandy's studio, he asked in his distinctive style, who drew that? That's epic. And then he said, I want that man in my office now. And so I went. And four weeks later, the competition entry drawings were duly finished. Four of us were on this project, including, funnily enough, my first year tutor from 10 years previous. After, after this drawing exercise, I went on to carry out regular work on a self-employed basis within the office. In effect, I became their in-house illustrator, as well as doing design work and routine architectural work. And thus began a very satisfying five to six years. Lindsay specialised in restoration and refurbishment of historic buildings, and also new build here and in the Middle East. Initially, I was on design work with planning and working drawings for refurbishment in Speyside. Uh, but then came the, the requirement to do the first major perspective drawing as such. I couldn't draw trees, but trees were needed. And this was a hurdle that was going to have to be overcome. And an afternoon's outdoor practice was urgently required. Happily, this did the trick. And um, this, uh, this perspective on this slide was the result. I had my afternoon and went on to do this. Uh, there's not much foliage here, as you can see, some of these things very much winter trees, but it was a December afternoon, so you know, there you go. It was a project to rebuild the nunnery on Iona for a variety of possible uses. Uh, this didn't go ahead in the end, they, 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 they stabilised the ruins and these are just uh, looked after um, as they are. Uh, for a while, I did winter trees just to get on top of how they grow the way they do and so over a, gradually over a few weeks I got myself out of the woods on that one or a blah not in a manner of speaking. Then later on I gradually moved on to summer trees and somebody once commented and it was a compliment uh, that I've never seen so much greenery and when you see the slides later on you'll see what I mean. The next two perspectives, which ironically were completely treeless, were of two unrealised projects in Orkney. The first one was Kirkwall Packing Station, uh, a, a plan to refurbish this building. The building's still there, but it's very tatty. Uh, it was up there a few years ago and, and uh, had a look at it. Um, this together with the nunnery perspective on the previous slide, uh, the, these together with most of the slides I was doing at this time, are drawn in soft pencil on tracing paper. And I'll, the reason for doing this, I, I'll go into this um, a wee bit later on. Um, the, the, next, the next was a, a departure, actually. This was, this was a, a motel also in Kirkwall, uh, which wasn't built, but it was a project. And this one was done with architect's drawing pen, rotary or similar, on tracing paper. I decided that it would be quite a challenge to try what, what one might call a pen and ink half tone and um, that, was, that was the result. The main, um, now the, the main uh, client uh, for Lindsay's, their, their biggest client, if you like, were um, uh, the Iona Cathedral Trust, um, for whom Lindsay's were architects in charge. And there was a sizable requirement for publicity material. And for me, this marked the beginning of many drawings over the next few years. I'm gonna dip into that, um, ginger uh, wine actually and voices a wee bit. Sorry about that, cheers. Um, this, uh, that, that's, a, that's a little drawing of the, of, the, of the cloister before it's restored. And the next one is a drawing of St John's Cross, which um, uh, it was lying in fragments on the ground at the west door of the abbey, it had been absolutely smashed to bits by all the Atlantic gales. And um, this drawing shows the weather-beaten fragments pieced together. It was, um, they were 
um, assembled into, into a, a, a quite a clever um, phosphor bronze frame just to hold everything together and relocated in the Iona Museum building. Um, I don't want to get too technical about anything, but this geometry here um, was simply, um, the, the, for various reasons, this geometry was uh, quite complex because it involved something called vertical vanishing. And as soon as you get into that, the, the, the whole picture plane, um, the, the image that you're, you're, that you're going to end up is, is on a tilt. And because it's on a tilt, you've, you've got to do the various projections. So instead of working on one part of the drawing board with one lump of geometry, you're working with two lumps of geometry and relating them together. And it was always very useful to have a template as a starting point. And so that's how that appeared in connection with this drawing. And it makes a, it, it makes a, a, a nice piece to present as well. Um, the main commission, however, was for interpretation panels. And this comprised eight large display boards to be mounted on the north wall of the cloister with one more at the nunnery. And these outlined the history and rebuilding of the abbey together with ongoing maintenance and a funding appeal. They included titles, script, graphic layouts, and roughly 40 drawings together with photographs. Also the history and the wording of this had to be researched. On this, I consulted with the then professor of history at Glasgow University, Archie Duncan, who was extremely helpful. This was the late 70s, there was no internet, there was no desktop publishing. Nevertheless, although the text was handwritten, I was able to justify this to both left and right margins. I had my own method for that one. Uh, in other words, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm presenting it a bit like a, a newspaper column and, and keeping sharp edges on, on either side. Um, it was impossible to get reasonably good priced copies of these. These, these aren't actually photographs of the originals. Um, one, the, what, what you see here is a digital copy using the original images. Uh, the script has been replaced with an almost identical letterface and it looks actually remarkably similar to the, to the original. Um, a f a, these are a few of the typical panel drawings. Um, those uh, interior of the of the abbey, uh, St John's Cross again. Uh, that was the that's the Iona nunnery. Uh, this time as as the ruin, um, which is which is as it is today. This I believe it's either St Matthew or St Martin. I never know the know which. I think it's um, Martin's Cross. Um, this is the chapter house. Um, that's the, the nave at the west end of the abbey just shortly after restoration and that's uh, the south aisle. Uh, so there must have been, uh, yes, yeah, so about 40, 40 of these drawings in all. Um, along, alongside, there was other stuff though as well, alongside general architecture and design um, for, the, for, for Ian Lenses, I was producing presentation drawings for most of their other jobs perspectives, rendered plans and elevations, brochure drawings, etc. Iona was ongoing, as, as below. Um, Inverera Castle, Thorston Castle, commercial and residential developments. And also um, there was an associate um, company called the Dalgleish Lindsay Group. Um, and and their, uh, their business was in the Gulf States and in Africa and um, Eastern Europe somewhere, I think. Uh, Greece, Greece, I think it was. Um, and there was a lot of work there, including racing stadia, palace buildings, villas, etc. So also following a joint project between Lindsay's and Rum Jums, Robert Matthews, I found myself working on various Middle East projects for Rum Jums as well. This was the first of several camel racetrack stadia to be built in Dubai. Um, designed by Lindsay's, with Ramjam as consulting structural engineers. I believe this was finally done with uh, GRC, which is glass reinforced concrete, um, which is just fired out of, literally out of a spray gun and sprayed onto a steel structural mesh, which was, um, which was uh, assembled on top of uh, um, steel columns. And the idea was to resemble traditional, the sort of traditional design you would get in Bedouin tents. Very effective. Uh, this, this was a few years later, and this is another camel racetrack. This wasn't for Lindsay's, this was for Rum Jums, for, for their architectural department. And I'm going to stay on this slide for a moment. The first thing you'll notice is we've now gone from black and white into colour, and there's a very good reason for this. Um, it's, uh, it was, uh, 
it's worth mentioning that one, one huge challenge of this job up to the early 1980s was to maintain a good quality portfolio. This was, this was, this was the bugbear for, for most people, uh, was to get decent prints of everything. Um, in the 60s and 70s, color printing was best achieved photographically, and it wasn't that great, to be quite honest. But for decent sized prints, say A3, this was extremely expensive. Consequently, most of the perspective drawings were in black pen or pencil on tracing paper and fed through an ammonia dye line printer. These are amazing machines, huge great steel box with, a, with rollers and ultraviolet light and they stank of ammonia and it's absolutely brilliant because that would wake you up if you're running off prints at nine o'clock in the morning. Absolutely brilliant. And what came out was at the same size with the choice of several papers. The best one being glossy white Ozolux paper, which was um, very similar to photographic paper. The dye, however, was um, prone to fading over time and long-term storage of the prints had to be away from any light. But fortunately, I also have access to most of the originals here. So they, they've been scanned in sections by myself, stitched together and cleaned up in Photoshop. And this was done later on once I had the facilities to do this. So that, that takes care of the early black and white drawings. By the 1980s, color was becoming affordable. The one or two copying companies, I'm not going to mention any names here, but <laughs> oh, they were, had to be seen to be believed. They were using instant photography such as Siba or Ilfochrome, but their techniques were only, te their technicians were only partly trained and the results were terrible. However, there was one man trained in both art and photography who knew exactly what he was doing. And it's because of him that many of these images are in, are in existence. His name is Ray Wilson and his company, Ray Graphics, is still going strong. They're now digital printers in Edinburgh. And he got fantastic results from Ciba Chrome equipment and later from Canon bubble jet technology. Um, I part, you know, for anyone who, who's not sort of au fait with all the various names, don't worry. It's, it's not actually, um, it, you know, you don't absolutely have to know everything about, you know, what Canon bubble jet technology is, apart from the fact that it's just a method of color printing. Um, so anyway, with this new facility, I changed from pen or black pencil on tracing paper to color pencil on polyester drafting film. And I always made sure to get prints of the more important drawings. And I kept these in a drawer for future use. The other thing was, so did Ray. <laughs> and uh, he got me an awful lot of work because people used to go into his shop and say, do you know of any good illustrators? And he said, well, I've got a few here. And he'd pull, pull prints of my stuff out of the drawer. And he did this for one or two people, and it, it, kept, it kept one or two of us uh, very nicely in business. By the mid-90s, I was computerized, and I've been scanning my own artwork ever since. So after that point, no problem. Meanwhile, my printed copies produced by Rapo Graphics are now scanned, again by myself, and the images cleaned up and sharpened where necessary. Without these, there would have been a 10-year gap in my recorded output. This drawing is, this is a long way of saying this drawing is one such example out of many. So now we're back to the slides, you'll be pleased to see. And um, I've now got a, a rich seam of work with, uh, with rum jumps, which took me to Dubai on three occasions. In their Edinburgh office, I found myself working with one-time fellow students. Although by now Sir Robert obviously was no longer there, it was a pleasant reminder of the strong connection with the School of Architecture. Things then changed and there was a general downsizing of everything in the early 80s recession and it was time to ad advertise myself more and get new clients on board. Uh, this is stuff I was still doing with run jumps and this was, um, the, there was a sort of o overlap. Um, and this, this was just shortly after one of my first visit to Dubai and the interior of the Dubai Hilton as it was in 1984 it would be. And then this was shortly after that, this was a, a spec tower in um, speculative office block in Shanghai, one in Canton. They, they were, um, their, their business was moving into China as China was at that time opening up a bit more to the West. And this was a, a development office and apartments development in Shalala in Oman. Um, Anyway, with the, with the downsizing of everything, it was, uh, I, from 1983, I was freelancing from my small studio at home. Lindsay's, now changed to Crichton Lang, Willis and Galloway, remained on my client base and also Rum Jums, uh, which overlapped this period and continued for many years. So including some of these buildings that you see there. Uh, major clients, as Alan mentioned before, major clients thereafter included, well, Percy Johnson Marshall, 
um, and partners. Percy was the brother of Stuart Johnson Marshall, who was the co-founder of Rum Jumps. So the two brothers were um, uh, both in Edinburgh doing much the same thing. Um, the Un Unwin Jones partnership in Carlisle, they were, they were probably best known in Scotland at any rate for the funicular, Cairngorm funicular, uh, which has uh, had rather a patchy history, unfortunately, but I think, I think they'll get there in the end. Um, Riachan Hall, I did my student year out with them, plus a bit more afterwards. Uh, Applecross, which is a well-known Edinburgh property development, developer. Uh, Michael Laird Partnership, a huge firm of architects. Carl Fisher Sibbald, they're architects who are in charge of the Jeffrey Street Jewelry Hotel site at the moment. Um, Royal College of Surgeons, uh, I did a quincentenary book cover for them, plus some earlier work, which you'll see later on, and many, many more. One of the, the one client, however, of extreme importance was, and again, uh, Alan mentioned this, uh, was Historic Scotland. And I had already done some illustrations of Scarra Bray for them indirectly. Now I was commissioned to do, th that drawing there is of Stirling Castle, we'll go back to that. Um, now I was commissioned to do 15 drawings of Edinburgh Castle for the 1994 edition of the Tourist Booklet. As well as the obvious artistic reasons for this, there was the practical benefit of being able to emit all the tourist paraphernalia, such as signboards, exit lights, cables, etc., without editing everything in Photoshop afterwards. That would have been the pitfall for a completely photographic um, survey. Uh, the slide shows selection of finished drawings and two of the rough drafts. We've got Argyle House here, uh, Crown Square, showing the uh, Scottish National War Memorial, um, the main gate, um, the Portcullis gate, the Argyle battery, and this was a draft of, I think it's the hospital building, if it's not it's the one adjacent, I think it's down at, the, it's down at that corner anyway. Um, and the Scara Bray, the, that, that's, these were the Scara Bray ones, um, and that was uh, that date, they, these date from the 1990s and were commissioned indirectly by through marketing design, design agency. So anyone who's been, who's been there will immediately recognize uh, these ones. Uh, this one on the left, that was a, a reconstruction which they wanted showing, um, projecting the, the sort of typical life of a Neolithic family in, in one of their homes. So we've got this couple, loving couple enjoying their chip butties in, a, um, in, in their apartment in downtown Scarra Bray, I suppose. That's what it amounts to. Um, then also there was Glasgow Cathedral. I had about 12, 12 13 drawings for, for that. Uh, that was um, totally different and uh, a wonderful job to get to do. And then also at Stirling Castle, which, uh, and there was one of these visible, that was, um, again, it was another 12 um, drawings for Stirling. And uh, that, that was um, very, sim very similar to the Edinburgh, draw Edinburgh drawings, obviously, very similar sort of exercise. Then we come to um, more local interest. Uh, we've got uh, East Lothian. And from time to time, I've done a few local drawings for a variety of purposes. And these range from framed prints for sale, exhibition drawings, cards, and also some commissions to draw buildings that happen to be in the county. Um, the three, three drawings of Dalton, that's that one there, that one there, and that one there. Um, are part of a set of seven framed prints dating from the mid 1980s. And copies of these were sold in the Castle Inn. They're, they're actually prints um, that were produced by Ray Wilson. The, the other two, Hales, Hales Castle and Saltcoats Castle, are more recent. Uh, that's the, the entrance into the main hall, Hales Castle, but it's accessed by a set of wooden steps to get people up, up to that level. And Saltcoats Castle, that's just, just very near me, um, about a few hundred yards south of Gullen. Then we went and carrying on with the East Lothian thing. Uh, these were drawings I did for myself for display purposes. Uh, this was for an exhibition for the East Lothian um, business, um, uh, business um, thing run by the council. Um, Bass Rock, obviously, um, Fenton Tower. This was, this was before it was restored. And uh, the Castle Inn in Dalton, um, where I enjoyed many, many a pleasant evening um, with, with uh, pleasant conversations 
um, with some of the locals. Uh, then there was a um, preliminary sketch, yes, a preliminary sketch of the Seabird Centre below. And in the centre is a draft for King's Care in at Archerfield. I've done several drawings for these. Um, for anyone who doesn't know that part of the um, part of the coastline, it's a, a sort of set of um, very, very upmarket luxury houses. They come in at a million to a million and a half each sort of thing. And um, some of them are, uh, most of them are in very traditional design. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them isn't. In fact, two or three aren't, but I've got um, a very nice contemporary one at the end, uh, the end of this talk. So coming back to Seabird Centre, um, th this again uh, was used for their display board. And it, they, were, they were running on a, a very tight budget at the time, but I, I did get paid for it just. And uh, it was, uh, it actually looks nicer than it actually is, I think, because they um, then went on to decide to an anodize the copper roof. And as a result, the, the roof is a sort of dull brown color instead of that uh, sort of attractive green. He also wanted to see um, uh, the, uh, I think it was uh, the rear admiral who was in charge of, of um, getting this done, wanted to see the islands um, moved in together a bit more. So he settled for not seeing the bass, but as long as we saw the, uh, uh, the May and the, the Craig over there with a bit of the Fife coastline, just as a, uh, just a, a tourist impression, really. Um, then we moved to uh, Haddington and uh, mm -hmm. the uh, townhouse, and we've got the Nun Great Bridge, then we've also got another one of Dalton. Uh, this time, this was a Christmas card, and it was a, a redraw of the Dalton Parish Kirk. And this one was commissioned for refurbishment at Hedewick, Hedewick, Harm, Hedewick Farm, which is roughly between uh, Dunbar and East Linton and a bit south of the A1, I thought I remember. Then the next one, this is, at, um, this is a house near Gilmerton, and this was uh, a refurbishment of, for, uh, it was the, uh, Terry, Terry Steele, who was a merchant banker, owned the house at the time. He bought it as, as the, it was called the cart shed in these days, and he remained, uh, renamed it the Eight Arches. And he, he, he did a loving refurbishment and beautiful um, uh, uh, interior um, design. And he decided he wanted to commission me to do some nice perspectives, which he could then frame and hang up on the wall of his house, which he duly did. And the condition was that I included in one of the perspectives one of his prized possessions of all time, and that was his Martin guitar. That had to go in. So that's, uh, it's in. Then uh, th these, are, these are all in, these in, are not in any particular order. They're just um, uh, just to give a, a sort of varied idea of, of what I've been doing. Uh, this is Redcroft uh, Apartments by Millers in North Berwick, Red, Redcroft. Um, that, that's overlooking, literally overlooking the station platform. And then we've got Woodbush in Dunbar for East Lothian Housing Association. And then we've got Hedwick again, um, a, a larger one this time. This was done, this was commissioned by uh, Gilmore and Stamp, who were, um, who were architects in North Berwick, and they had an office on um, the a boat that was moored on the shore at Leith. It was quite, quite an interesting place. Uh, David Stamp, sadly, is uh, no longer around, um, but he, uh, he commissioned this um, quite a long time ago, in 2003, yes, 2003. And uh, it was quite nice, he, he wanted to um, just illustrate a few um, detailed bits of detail as well in, in the drawing. Then this one, this one is a, a curiosity. This uh, this is actually um, a design uh, by Case Design Musselboroughs, who are who are no more, but um, they used to be in Musselboro in New Hales House, and they uh, th this was um, a scheme for Briary Bank in Haddington, and it was very very controversial site. So there was there was a lot of opposition to building there at all. And of course now it's, it's built on, I mean, Calla developed on it. This was back in 1990. Yes, it's as early as 1990 and a much more traditional design. And I, I must say, I, I was kind of hoping this one might go ahead, but unfortunately it didn't. And there you go. And it's now developed by, developed by others. Um, I'm now going to go into the, uh, 
to, to, to the methods. And I, I don't want to get too technical about this, but um, I'm, I'm going to go through a, a selection of the rest of my work. Um, and I'm going to whiz through this, um, hopefully fairly quickly. Um, there were basically, basically three methods of doing all of this. And uh, one, one is to set it, setting up on the drawing board. This, this is the, the method this is the method that had to be used pretty much before the uh, onset of computing uh, and then using the computer modeling computer and using CAD software is the second method and the third method which is um, runs in parallel to everything else because it's always been one of the methods was working from photographs so the the, the first method one is traditional method um, and for this one requires a drawing board, a T-square and a set square or a parallel motion, long straight edges and miles of detail and tracing paper and probably miles of pencil lead. Uh, for, first of all the angles and the viewpoint, this is roughly what it looks like at the beginning of the job. Um, I draw out a view angle of approximately 60 degrees which is uh, that one there on tracing paper and I slide the architect's plan underneath and angle it to get a potentially good view. In other words, I, I'm working out the position for a virtual camera on plan. And this, this has to be right. You'll see why in the next slide. This has to be right the first time um, because you really don't want to be starting all over again. But there are certain basic camera rules as, as there are when you take a photograph. For example, um, you know, if it's a long, narrow building, um, going on 45 45 um, in other words 45 that way and 45 that way looks good but looks terrible if it's a square building um, for a square square building you want 2070 which I think um, that's what this is by the looks of it um, or and 3060 is is a good one for most other um, buildings and various rules like keep everything within the middle third where possible but keep things away from the actual center um, and the various other geometrical rules. And if these boxes are ticked, then the chances are that unless I'm exceedingly lucky, uh, the whole thing should work out. Then I uh, work out the vanishing points and picture plane, which is determined by the final chosen drawing size, etc., etc. These are just, let's leave these as technical terms. And then I set, set up heights and other geometry and get drafting. And this is what it looks like. So as you can see, if I get that wrong, I've got to start start all over again to reach that stage. So that, that was not good news. It happened once or twice, but then I, I call it messing around time and I would just give myself a day to catch up. And that's, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, so once the, once the, um, I, I remove the plan from underneath and I place um, a final sheet on top of tracing fame tracing paper or film, and I trace through and render up. This is done in colour pencil with pen or black pencil as well. If the perspective is required on white paper, then both sheets have to be transferred to a light table. This is, um, this, it's okay, I mean it's a bit cumbersome and I had to do it once or twice, but fortunately not too often. The uh, plastic film is very very smooth it has no key, so a texture sheet is used underneath as required. And this is uh, linen paper or terrelene sailcloth, and that gives a nice, that transfers on, gives a nice sort of canvas uh, finish. It's a bit like doing rubbings, it's the same, it's the same sort of technique. And then this is the final result with the um, setting up taken out from underneath, and you're just left with a nice clean rendering. Um, this is another example from the setup stage, and this is a uh, by Percy Johnson Marshall and Partners, and this was Earl Grey Street in um, Toll Cross, and it's not the building that's there now, this was their, their predecessor, and then this was overtaken by um, the present scheme, which is also by them, as, as far as I remember. Um, so again, you know, with, on this one I'm sort of sketching on trees and figures, and I work out shadows, and also set up the, the odd car, um, just to establish scale. And then I place the final sheet on top and render down in color. And then here's the final result. Um, I lost some stone coursing on this one because that was a design change. They went into um, Harling. And, um, but apart from that, it uh, follows on. So, so we've gone from that to that. So we then move on to method two. 
and this was modeling up using CAD software. And the, uh, I, I, scan, I scan the I was supplied with this architect's drawing, which is just typical builders drawing a um, bit of landscaping, layout plan, sketch elevations, etc. So I scan this in and import the scan into the uh, software, the CAD software. CAD stands for computer aided drafting or computer aided design, I should say. Um, and uh, that, that's where that term comes from. So this is important. And the, the software I use is a package called Vectorworks, which is um, a lot easier to use than AutoCAD, but does the same job. And I, I trace this uh, digitally onto a new layer. And then uh, based on this, I build a, a 3D model. Um, it's software basically lets you extrude lines and stretch lines up into surfaces and to 3D polygons and space and all sorts of um, all, all sorts of uh, tools and tricks of the trade. And in the end, I, I end up only it's only a few hours or so end up this model. And um, just for example, uh, I've, I've shown two different views, one one for each each side. If I wanted to, I could I could spin that round and do an animation. So then the next stage is to choose choose a viewpoint for the uh, camera point, and that's what I've chosen. And I've drawn on just in two dimensions. Two dimensions. I've scribbled on a few trees, and that's my rough draft. And the client would approve that. And then I put that down the board, and I put a layer of drafting film over that, and I trace that down. So so we've now gone from uh, computer um, stuff to hand drawing. And then having got that, I uh, take that off the board and scan it, uh, and then I put it back on the board, and then I colour it up. That's, that's all the same sheet. And then once I've done that, I scan that, and then I, I, sometimes I put the scan, the line drawing scan, over on top as a sort of transparent overlay, digitally, you know, not, not physically. And, um, and that, that sharpens everything up and gives me the final result that you see there. This is another example. Um, this is called the Cube Cafe, and uh, this was a, um, a courtyard in a, um, a sort of 1970s type office block um, in Reading, I think it was. Uh, Croydon, no, it's in Croydon, I think. And um, the, so these, that's the architect's plan. This time it's a, a digital plan. Um, and this is my model based on that, and uh, added in um, various furnishings, and there were some feature plywood screens which end up painted yellow, quite attractive. Um, this, this was the, the same with the um, curtain walling added around the, uh, around the edge of the courtyard. And that's the, the chosen camera view. Uh, and that's the line drawing with a few figures um, added. And that's the finished drawing. Um, and so the, that's, that's, that's digital, that's done by hand, and that's done by hand. So at the, at the end of the day, it's a hand drawing. It's, it's, not a, it's not a digital image. So then we come to a third method. And this, this, is, this, is, this method is, is not, uh, this isn't in sequence. This is just um, the, the, the other method using photographs. And um, this has been done since time immemorial as required. Um, it's just basically using photographic information and not having to do your own setup. So for this particular one, uh, this was um, in Berkhamsted mm -hmm. in Hertfordshire. Um, it was the college, college campus. And it was a, an out-of-date uh, photograph, uh, which was uh, email, emailed up. And it needed buildings added or updated. Uh, unfortunately, these came away and were replaced with a, a sort of rather ugly 60s block. Um, so the first of all, the photograph was um, uh, scanned and uh, Print. It was um, processed, lightened up, and tinted slightly just to make it nice to work from. And that, that's my base drawing. Um, and there I've, I put my um, final sheet over that and traced by hand in pencil. Um, then I take the photograph out from underneath. That's my, my hand drawn pencil line drawing. And that's the uh, color rendering um, on top of that. And that's uh, the finished result. So now I'm going to return to, th this is the, um, the, the gallery time. 
and um, the, these again aren't in any particular order, uh, but they're just a selection of, of my work over over a um, the, the sort of period period of time, um, thirty or forty years. Um, this first one is uh, that was a Christmas card I did for myself, and uh, it was the St Stephen Street, the Playfair Church at the bottom of the hill. Um, I spent many pleasurable evenings there, actually, for years and years and years, uh, dancing something called Siroc. And they used to, every Thursday night, I used to be down there um, dancing for a type of it was a type of jive, and dancing every day uh, there for two and a half hours, you know, every week. And, and then we'd go for a pint in the St Vincent's, which was just across the road over there, roughly. Um, this one here was, uh, this was actually in connection with another job you'll see later on, uh, but it was, it was a scheme by Reichen Hall in connection with the council to um, put in incinerator in Seafield. This didn't go ahead because of um, the air conditions weren't suitable, but this was to verify that the thing wasn't going to be too obtrusive from, as seen from the, um, the, from the castle. And I think, as far as I remember, I think that's the building there, and it wasn't really going to show up. Portobello power station was still there in these days, and there was still quite a lot of industrial development visible along the, the Leith waterline. Um, so it was, it was a good excuse, basically, for to do a nice um, uh, to do a nice aerial view of Edinburgh in a, in a slightly stylized manner, um, and uh, they were uh, it was well received. This um, I expect most of you will recognise this building. Um, Standard Life, uh, Michael Laird partnership. Um, the horses never never appeared there, unfortunately. They, um, I think, they were probably a bit tempting for metal thieves, to be quite honest. Uh, but apart from that, it's pretty much the same, except it's not as bright. The roof is the roof is much greyer than that. Uh, but I think the I think the stonework's about right, given in, given that it might be bright sunshine at the time. This is what in Edinburgh, about fifty fifty probably. Um, this was uh, across the road. This is, I, I, I ended up doing quite a lot of buildings actually just in, the, in this part of town. It was, it was quite uncanny actually. Uh, e even, even up towards Torf, um, Torf Street and round the back streets as well. Um, th this was West Approach Road. This was Exchange Plaza. And uh, that on the, on the right hand side, that's just a glimpse of Terry Farrell's um, uh, conference center. And on the left hand side, that's Standard Life again. Uh, in the distance. And then I was involved in another building over here, which is Bailey Gifford, and that was uh, designed by Case Design, who had also done the Briary Bank scheme in Haddington. It's all a small world. It's, uh, in Edinburgh, so, um, I, uh, most of my work was, I did a lot of work in Carlisle, jobs in London and that sort of thing, but, but the Edinburgh stuff, it was all like, it's all like one office in a way. Everyone knows everyone else. Um, Harvey Next by Night, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, an interesting one to do. And uh, Harvey Nicks by day. <laughs> and then this was, this is get the, the last two plus this one were for a firm called Comprehensive Design Architects. And they are 99.9% .9 of their clients are retail, in retail. And all the jobs I did pretty much uh, apart from one were, were in the retail, uh, retail sector. And so this was the refurbishment of the old Sun Alliance building in the corner of Castle Street and George Street. Um, and it was uh, ended up basically as, um, I'm not quite sure, sort of department store, probably shops, probably both uh, under the same roof. And then they, they put a, a restaurant up at roof level as well. So that was, uh, and there were two, there was another one looking from the, from the other side. Uh, so they gave me uh, two to do of these. Uh, then this was, uh, this was a personal project by Sir Michael Laird when he was alive and this, uh, he wanted to have a, have a look at the, um, Scott, the, the National Portrait Gallery and try and give it a bit of a makeover. And so to this end he commissioned a, 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 a night one and also a day, a day one from the other side. So I've got a, um, judging by the fact there are leaves on the two trees that he proposed to put there, um, it looks like a, a a very very wet September night. <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was good drawing to do that. I enjoyed doing that. And again, if it hadn't been for Ray Wilson, I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't have this slide. Uh, that was that was because of him. So I've got that. Um, 
this was uh, again another one um, and again because of Ray Wilson um, I have this slide it's thanks to him this was commissioned by a firm called Stephen and Maxwell who were um, architects in Edinburgh at the time and uh, this was for Doolittle's which was the forerunner of Ryan's Bar and so it's a uh, Hopeton, Hopeton Street um, is Hopeton Street isn't it yes it is it's a, it's a very very famous landmark and then you've got St George's West or something in the, in the distance there. Um, I'm being told that my inter internet connection is unstable, so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. I, that's the last thing we want. I just the thing just flashed up there. So anyway, we'll just uh, crash on. Um, this this was the uh, West Maitland Street. Um, th this was the revitalisation of uh, the business community following the tram works. Uh, and this was done for Edinburgh World Heritage. This was a joint initiative between uh, Edinburgh World Heritage, the property owners and the City of Edinburgh Council to renovate up to 16 shop fronts. And this drawing appeared on both BBC and STV News. Uh, so it got quite a good lot of mileage and it was all over Twitter at the time. Um, I've cut away the, it, it was, the, the colour rendering went right across to the other side, but I cut that away just to show a bit of the line drawing as well, because I, uh, I was quite pleased with the line drawing on its own. Uh, then we have the Royal College of Surgeons here, oh. um, and this was um, the, uh, this, this was um, one of a set of drawings uh, when they were refurbishing in 1991, and in this particular view, they used as um, a Christmas card, I believe. And then the other two were for myself. Uh, that was a Christmas card that was based on the overseas building um, in Princess Street, which is no longer the overseas building. And that's the toll booth in Cannon Gate. And again, so these, these were private projects, which I always do to keep heart and soul together. Um, then we move on to the, the Bank of Scotland, um, in these days the British Linen Bank, and they were um, commemorating the, their tercentenary, and they were doing this by, um, uh, they wanted illustrations of all the headquarters that they had in Edinburgh uh, down through the ages, well, over 300 years, I suppose. Um, these drawings were never used. They were commissioned not by them direct, but through a, a graphics company, and um, they were well received, but then disappeared. <laughs> um, and there's absolutely no no presence of them on the internet or no record record of them anywhere so um, I, I always feel free to use them. Uh, this was their earliest headquarters this was uh, built in 1700 in Old Bank Close and it's now part of the main structure of George IV Bridge I think and the bridge was just built right over that. Um, then, then, they, then they moved to uh, Milne Square which again no longer exists that's down the hill in the mile I think it's um, Possibly just north of the just north of the Royal Mile, um, but it's it's down it's down near Jeffrey Street, I think, maybe a bit further down. Um, then, then in eighteen o six, they built the Mound Headquarters, which is this one, um, and that was designed by two pupils of Robert Adam. And then finally, uh, the in eighteen seventy eight, um, they they've got the final uh, David Bryce building. And that wasn't demolished at all. The, the David, David Bryce built, built that round that. So in, in other words, take away the balustrading, take away the windows, take away the balconies, leave the walls. Um, these are all doorways and, and, and these become the new external walls. He added the east wing and the west wing and, and the totally new facade. The dome, I said, the dome is just where the dome was, but with a new cupola on top. Okay. It's amazing what people got up to, especially in Victorian times, um, almost as bad as 20th century, actually. Um, and then this is the Scottish National Gallery, uh, interior restored in 1988 to the original Playfair design. Uh, this was commissioned by Property Services Agency. Um, I've got a figure in there, which I think, uh, as far as I remember, was meant to be Crichton Lang. I don't know why I put him in, but it just seemed like a good idea at the time. And then I've got, um, although he wasn't connected with this, and then I've got a, um, a few pictures. I've got a Vermeer, I think, in, in there. It looks a bit like Mary and Martha, but I don't know if that's actually owned by the gallery or not. Uh, that one is the beheading of John the Baptist. Um, I'm always fascinated by that one. Um, not quite sure why. 
this this was um, uh, by Applecross, the uh, developer. They they were they're very well known in Edinburgh. They were uh, they did a lot of uh, traditional um, stuck very much to traditional designs. And um, Colin was very fond fond of the you know crowstep traditional methods, crowstep gables, um, turrets and corner towers, um, corbelling cor um, gables corbelled out at the top storey, uh, nice leaded looking windows. Um, his stonework was never real though, it's artificial stone, so it always looked a little bit bland, but um, there were some nice designs coming out of there. Um, however, they, they're not, they're, uh, they actually went on to modernist stuff as well, so I've got the uh, lovely building in Kinnear Road, which will be coming up um, fairly soon. This was Upper Grey Street, and um, that's existing, and they bought that part. Uh, that was the Peter Walker building yard, and uh, so that's all new build, and they buttoned the two together and um, formed a very nice looking development. Uh, th this is Kinnear Road, this is the one I was talking about. Um, and this, this was, um, they, they got together with Millers, and uh, they, 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 it was a sort of merger. Um, and never know whether things are mergers or takeovers or what they are. The only people that know are the, usually the accountants and, and the directors involved. Uh, it, you know, it's an inside situation. Um, so, yes, so, so these were two, two apartment blocks on Kinnear Road. I don't, don't know if Kinnear Road, it's kind of off the beaten track very much. It's, it's, um, I hadn't actually heard of it originally, but it's a long cul-de-sac off Arboretum Road which is the road running past the Botanic Gardens and joining um, in Verleith Place, I think. Um, and so it, it goes on for quite a long way. When you get to the far end, um, all of a sudden you've got these, you've got something else under construction and a couple of quite modernist houses um, further, further along to the right, which uh, remind me of, um, oh, Adolf Luce in the 1930s. You know, it, it's quite interesting stuff. So then we get some, some Edinburgh projects which weren't built. Um, this is uh, Bonington Bond, um, conversion to apartments, Bonington Road, uh, by Percy Johnson Marshall and partners. Uh, it, it, it is now, I think, apartments. Um, it's gated um, by a very high wall. You can't really see what's going on inside, but it's certainly not that design. Uh, so I think the developer um, the developer and possibly the architect changed on that one. I'm not really sure. Uh, Murrayfield Nursing Home. Um, we've got these very, very characteristic sort of postmodernist 1980s type um, uh, wraparound uh, development there. Uh, it was never built. I, mean, I think it's a car park there, um, but they, they've got uh, new, uh, modern, well, newer buildings and extensions of things further back. Um, then we come back to the Seafield Incinerator. Um, and this was, uh, this was how it's going to look from Joppa, uh, looking across. So you've got the, the, the Joppa sands going into the Portobello sands, and then that, that's um, how it's going to appear. Um, with, I think, a Portobello power station, I think, in, in the background, still there. So it was, it was a nice excuse. To, don't often get the excuse to draw a bit of industrial landscape. It, it was quite interesting, especially um, having chosen a sort of fairly stylized technique to, to do so. And then this was an aerial shot based on a photograph. Um, oh no, I tell you, no, it wasn't. I set that up by hand. Yes, I set that up by hand. Um, and uh, I had all the heights and all the information. And that's the incinerator itself. So, of course, that's doing the job. That was going to have done the job that's now being done by Moncton Hall and also Viridor in, in Dunbar. The Moncton Hall actually looks coming down the A1. I couldn't, I didn't know what it was. They were building there. I thought it was a travel lodge with a chimney, <laughs> you know, um, until somebody told me what it was. I couldn't believe it actually. The first building you see in Edinburgh, you know, up in the skyline, incinerator. But there, there you go. Um, so then we've got other drawings. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I think I've got another 10 minutes or so. I hope that's right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming at, 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 um, at keeping it um, down to an hour. So uh, other drawings. Um, this is uh, Infirmary Street Baths. Um, 
that was a, a wonderful place to go and have a swim. And I had hours and hours of enjoyment in that place. You could, you could float on your back and look at these wonderful Victorian trusses, or you could just get the head down and, and go for it. Um, I think there was one time I swam a mile in there, uh, which was amazing because it was, it was actually quite a short pool. I think I was probably doing more turning than actually um, strokes. Um, and it's now, uh, that, that, was, that was a scheme by Percy Johnson Marshall to refurbish it. But it wasn't going to be possible because uh, apparently the foundations were cracking and, you know, to support a, a swimming pool was going to be prohibitively expensive. Um, I, think, I think they were ready, the water was beginning to sort of seep out a bit. So it's, it's, um, it's now the Dovecot Studios, uh, designed by Malcolm Fraser, and it's a, it's a pretty, good, um, it's pretty good use for the building, I think. Though I, I must admit, I do miss the water and I do miss the blue. I think they painted that all out in white. Um, then Glenborrowdale Castle, that was commissioned by Stephen and Maxwell. Um, they were the same architects that commissioned the Hopeton, uh, the, the Doolittle's restaurant, come Ryan's bar. Um, so this, this was um, a, a scheme to put a bit of new build, a little bit of new build there, a little bit of new build there, and a refurbishment of the Sun Lounge. None of it happened, but it all looks pretty much the same uh, apart from that, it's pretty much as, as is. Um, then we have uh, a bar interior for um, UJP in Carlisle. Um, this, is, this is ink actually. I'm, I really fancy doing an ink drawing and uh, I, just, I, just, I get in the mood and I, I just want to do some cross hatching and, and just get down to it. And I did this, this is one of my favorite drawings actually, but they didn't like it. Um, well, it wasn't them that didn't like it so much as their client, he wasn't happy with it. So uh, very much in, in, these, in these sort of situations, it's not sort of like and don't like, it's what's been asked for. That's what it's about really. And um, although he hadn't asked specifically for pencil drawing, he'd been expecting a pencil drawing. So I rushed up a quiz, we spent the next five hours um, rushing up a quick pencil one instead, and that was fine, and he was delighted. And meanwhile, this, this, this is the one that I keep in my portfolio. Um, then this was, a, um, this date, dates back to 1986, and it's for the Glasgow Garden Festival. Um, uh, yeah, Glasgow Garden Festival. And it was a competition entry by Roxburgh Eng uh, Civil Engineers in Glasgow for a canal bridge. And basically the idea that, I didn't actually draw it in, but that, that was meant to be, that was going to be a railway line. It was a narrow gauge railway going through there. And it was a railway lift bridge. And it was going to get people from um, one, one side of the um, canal basin, sort of artificial um, uh, pond thing, which was being constructed to the other side. Um, and then the trusses, the, the, all the trusses as, as, you, as you go down that, that one there, and then the next one, and the next one, and then there's one at high level in the distance. They're all based on the, um, the, the gateway into the Barras market. Um, it's ironic, really, the, the, the Barras great gateway, I don't know what it's like now, but the last time I saw it, it was pretty dilapidated and, and rusty and what have you. Uh, it looks beautiful there, but it, it's just basically that arch with these little rings. Uh, you know, it's very, it's, it's, it's iconic for, for, for Glasgow, really. Um, this one was for um, uh, a firm in London called Aquarium Architects, and this was a sub, two sub, uh, sub basement, but they're both the same bar. Yes, they are, sub basement bar. Um, what this firm was doing was they were um, providing tropical fish and installing them and, um, and running them on a maintenance contract. And they also had an architect um, or have an architect on the, on, on the firm who, who does all the, um, all the, all the building um, permissions and design work and what have you. And this was, uh, this was done in a, a sub-basement. Everyone was digging up their, their basements in London. They were making sub-basements and extending their properties down into the ground. Uh, and the, uh, the, it caused a great deal of alarm amongst the local authorities. And I don't think it's uh, allowed any longer, but there was a spate of people doing these things at the time. Um, so yes, I did quite a lot of work for them. I, I, I tripped down to Manchester and photographing tropical fish for about, <laughs> for most of the day. Um, this, this was by uh, Unwin Jones, and this was um, near Durham. It's a Seaham uh, health spa. And this was, 
this was the concept drawing. This, 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 this was presented to the client. This was what was proposed, uh, presented to the council, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what's built at the end of the day is a rather dull sort of. It's it's not like that at all. It's it's quite dull in colour, and it's littered with um, uh, signposts and posters and everything, and car parking signs and. Um, for all I know, that's probably car parking in the foreground, I don't know, but um, anyway, it certainly doesn't look like that. But um, I got four or five perspectives to do out of that, which was uh, most enjoyable. This is a uh, Scottish Amicable, West George Street, Glasgow, for Hugh Martin and Partners. Um, this one is St. Petersburg, the Gazprom Tower. Uh, this was the original Ram Jam design. Um, it was then, it wasn't Ram Jams that completed it though, it's taken over by the um, Gore project in Russia and it's built, but it's built, and the design is based on the Ram Jam design, um, but built by a Gore project. Um, this is the uh, near Dune in Perthshire, um, Camp, Camp Hill Blair Drummond, uh, commissioned by Blair Drummond Trust. And this is the care and education for young people with special needs. So it's full of, um, you know, they're, they're working out the gardens, they've got workshops, they've got arts classes and paint shops and what have you. And again, you know, he wanted, um, he, he was quite open about what, whether colour or black and white. And I tried colour and didn't like it, came up with this and he was delighted. Um, so uh, that's, uh, it was well received. A nice sort of autumnal type drawing. Um, this was for um, a firm in London. I'm going to have to speed up here slightly. I'm just watching my time slightly. Um, this is uh, for Isgard Design in London, who specialised in private aircraft and luxury yachts. Um, I wasn't allowed to put any of the luxury yachts in um, because they were live projects. This one had been, uh, hadn't been taken up by the client, so I was allowed to reproduce this. Um, so a good glimpse into seeing how the other half live. Um, Strathclyde campus in Glasgow, mm -hmm. dates from um, 1990 or thereabouts, I think. Um, then we've got uh, Berkhamsted in Hertfordshire again, uh, line drawing. The college campus that you saw before is way up here somewhere. Um, and we're looking at the, the boys prep school and the girls school, Kingston, Kingston School for Girls. And, uh, netball and stuff and um, netball and hockey and tennis. Uh, there's a, the vast, there was quite a few actually, about a dozen or so aerial perspectives I did over the period of a few years. Um, this was college campus again, that's a full size drawing. Um, that's the nice Saturday afternoon on the playing fields. Um, then they've got the cricket ground in the background and the cricket, cricket pavilion. That was, a, that was another one that I uh, got to draw. Um, <laughs> Then this is um, some housing. This is bread and butter stuff. Um, this is for Yeoman McAllister Architects in Edinburgh. I've done quite a bit of work for them. Uh, Nethy Bridge, some housing at Nethy Bridge, some housing at Rate in Perthshire. Obviously, sort of you know regionally upmarket housing. And then this was sort of more um, not bottom end of the market, but mid market. Scotia Homes did hundreds of them. They're all much the same. It's just bread and butter stuff. Uh, you get about. 12, 12 houses to do at a time or something. And this is for Abbey Moore Homes, which is a nice little bungalow. Um, and then this is, this is my favorite one of all time. This is for Arnold Jones again. And this was the old Victorian boat, boathouse in Poolwood Bay off Lake Windermere. And um, it was pretty dilapidated and it's been restored and it's part of a cafeteria. To get into that cafeteria, I expect you can probably come by the back by road but you can also come by boat and you can go straight in there and up the steps and enjoy your gin and tonics on the balcony above. Um, and then finally this is just um, we're coming very close to the end of the, the talk now. Um, this is uh, the fast, last four slides. I've added in some recent work which post dates my publication. This plus the next are a, a from a set of eight perspectives produced over last December and January with revised versions dating from September this year. And it's a Baltic, Baltic Street development, um, which is bounded by Baltic Street, Constitution Street, Tower Street, and whatever's on the fourth side. I can't remember which, what runs down the fourth side. Uh, it was commissioned by Sundial Properties with architects Michael Laird partnership. So that's looking down Constitution Street. Um, that's, that's part of the development in there. Um, 
and, and then that's, uh, oh yes, you can see the trams coming up on the new tram extension. And the client, um, he, he didn't want any cars. He, he, he wanted to show it as a utopian environment, uh, student accommodation, retail, apartments, um, tram, trans public transport, and that's it, end of story. Um, and then this is looking from the other end, um, Tower, Tower Street, Constitution Street, that rotunda that dates from um, late 70s, early 80s, um, and, and that, that's already there. Um, then we've got, uh, this, this dates from uh, August uh, this year, and it's uh, in Brora, old, old Klein Primary School, and it's converted to a visitor centre, and that was um, commissioned by James Maxwell and Company in Venice. That's the same Maxwell as in Stephen and Maxwell, who used to be in Edinburgh. And then finally, from uh, March uh, last year, this was uh, Archerfield again. This is a plot, another plot at King's Cairn, but this time it's, it's a contemporary design and it's uh, done by an architect called Rory Gibson in Edinburgh. And uh, that, that, was a, that was a nice one to draw and it, it made a change from just drawing yet more traditional houses. So that's, the, that's just about the end of the talk. And um, so if you think I'm perhaps not fully retired yet, um, then all I can say is well spotted. Um, we've, uh, I've, I've, um, I've talked about my, uh, I've given a brief outline of my career as an architectural illustrator. Um, we've had a glimpse at the skills and techniques required and I've shown the sides of some of the drawings. My total output, um, and Alan mentioned this at the beginning, for hand-drawn illustrations only, it's estimated at well over 2,000. And the book contains a selection of just over 300 of these. Incidentally, in case anyone is interested, I should mention that there are a few copies available of the book from my own private stock offered at discount. Um, so if anyone wants to sort of, um, eh, sort of inquire about that, um, maybe the best way to do is get in touch with, um, uh, in touch with Alan and I can keep Alan um, briefed on, on um, you know, how much they cost and uh, availability, because I can just post them out, in fact. And fi finally, I would say that I firmly believe that if the technology is there, use it. Uh, after all, I've been using it for years in the production of a lot of these perspectives. However, if that technology were to disappear tomorrow, I could still produce any of what you've just seen, certainly as one-off originals. So, I, I always end these talks by saying that to hijack a, a well-known uh, to hijack a well-known saying, the last draftsman on the last battlefield will be armed with the following: as a T-square, a set square, a roll of tracing paper, and a box of pencils. So, with that thought, I thank you all for tuning in and listening so patiently to um, so patiently to my story. And again, a big thank you to Alan for inviting me to tell that story. Thank you. <laughs>